Yeah, we're in the middle of nowhere. It's true. Sometimes you got to get lost a little bit to figure out where it is you're going to go. So we're out here just outside of town, outside of Ridgecrest, uh, just north on the way to Trona. And uh, we had to stop at some at the side of the road. This is a part of the road that got displaced, but we're actually on the sand side. They were already repaired the road. Good job, Caltrans. It's awesome. You know, at least once a week, somebody asks me, hey, are these plans over-engineered? And then you get the opportunity to go out to the desert. You see how the ground cracked four miles deep. No, the plans are not over-engineered. When you see the ground crack like this, move, buckle, slip, it really gives you a very significant amount of respect for the forces that we're trying to deal with here. So let's take a little, let me show you a little bit around so you can see the scarring on the, on the surface of the earth. With that perspective, you'll have a better understanding of why we do what we do. Okay, let's check it out. So look at this stuff. If you didn't understand that there was an earthquake here, you may think that that was like some kind of an erosion trench or something like that. Look at how this, all of this sand just kind of rippled. In the desert, the, that top layer of sediment gets kind of hard and toasty. It's crazy. On that section there, it looks like there's actually displacement, like one part dropped. Now I would imagine USGS put these stuff out. Those are markers, I guess, for the satellite. Look at, at the amount of material that got moved there. The average foundation, it's only six inches thick, guys. Maybe two feet tall. You know, this is something that, that really requires a lot of thought, our work, whether it's from the engineering side and the installation side. When you see the ground scarred like this, and you understand that a building weighs 100,000 pounds, 250,000 pounds, a million pounds for some of those bigger buildings in the valley, the seismic wave is gonna create a two foot, maybe three foot high wave, half a million pound building, and slam it on the ground for two minutes. That's a scary thought. When you look at this stuff, there's a lot of buildings that are in big danger. And I'm not just talking about the big apartment buildings, I'm talking about houses too. When the ground moves like this, those little bolts that are five feet or 10 feet spread apart with a little tiny little cap, it's no, it's no match for this kind of force, you know? And look, this isn't like a, a scare video to get people to, to buy, you know, a house bolt down. This is just for you to see for yourself. It, it shouldn't be such an uphill battle to uh, convince people that putting a few brackets and bracing and bolting down the house is a good idea. Relatively speaking to what the house costs, the construction costs, maybe we can run into some, some more interesting people in Trona and get a, a, an opportunity to record their story. So let's go. So we are here in Trona, uh, kind of at the, the beginning of town in this little uh, subdivision. And we found our first Red Tech house. So I wanna kind of share with you what we found of uh, some pretty interesting stuff to observe. So what we're looking at here is obviously a pretty big crack. The bottom part of the crack is the stem wall, which is the concrete wall. And then above that, there's a, a wood mud sill. Earthquake was moving the foundation. And when you don't have a good connection between the stud wall, the mud sill, the floor system, and the stem wall, it breaks. It breaks at the weakest connection. Now, this house was red tagged. I mean, granted, this is not, you know, Bel Air. It's not a very expensive house. But honestly, with a five, $6,000, you know, expense to bolt down the house, and I'm talking about labor and materials, I don't know, maybe seven at the most, this is now close to $100,000 worth of damage. Luckily, the house didn't completely slip off, but you can obviously see that there was significant separation, significant shaking. Let's go around the other side and show you what that side of the house looks like. The stucco is actually that thick. 
the stem wall is really back there. So what's ended up happening is that the foundation actually pushed. This part wants to stay still. This part wants to move with the ground. When you don't have a connection between the two that's well done, the breaking is right there. What you're seeing, this big crack, it's in the stucco. The stucco is actually really thick. Again, this is not the foundation cracked here. It looks like it when you first see it, but this, this crack here is just the stucco. This wall slipped out and pushed. So right under here is the mud sill. There's a piece of wood kind of right there. And because it's not braced and bolted down, it allowed this part of the wall to slip. There is spider cracking pretty much on the entire surface of the wall. Here again, this is more, more pronounced. You can see, you see this chicken wire. This is just a little wire that holds the, the backside of this, see? These are the different layers of stucco in here. The longer the shaking takes place, the more stucco you lose. The more stucco you lose, then eventually the two by four studs start to violently shake and they start to break. So an earthquake causes, it's a two tier threat. The shaking that takes place, that damages the stucco and the masonry component. And then when things separate, you lose your lateral strength, then the wood starts to break. So here, this is actually really easy to illustrate. First, this looks like it's part of the foundation, but it's not, it's, it's just a, a solid piece of stucco. There's your stem wall right there. There's a the stucco wire. Then, you know, on the regular cement, they just skim and they get your, they build it up to about that thickness and that's it. But it's not, the stem wall is actually there. And then the connection, the displacement is right here where the wood is. The mud still did not stick to the stem wall. And then it allows it to bulge out. This is kind of really interesting because if you stand from this angle, you'll see that this is bulged out at the bottom. And it, it really is that the house wanted to stay still. When this was moving, this pushed this out, right? This is, you know what I'm saying? They were connected. And then you see, you see how this moves, this entire thing moves? As the spider cracking touches itself, huge parts, it's like a mirror that breaks, right? These stairs are obviously new. One of the sections of the house has suffered the most violent uh, part of the earthquake in the sense that the connection was the weakest. So it'll always break where it's the weakest. I would imagine if you do some forensics and you open up the stuff in here, the lumber to stem wall connections in here are not very good. You see this section here, how it's just hanging with the wire? See that? And again, that's below the mud sill. Here's your mud sill right there. That's why it's so important that mud sill is clamped down. And then the floor system sits on top of that. So it's also important for that to be clamped down to the mud sill. This is how it works. You tie the mud sill to the stem wall and then the floor joists, that has to be clamped down to the mud sill that's clamped down to the stem wall. That's how you get the ideal connection. If you wanna get really crazy, then you can connect the subfloor to the floor joist to the mud sill to the stem wall in that order. And then you get a pretty damn good connection. Do you guys think that when I see this, I've been doing this 15 years, there's no such thing as over engineering for an earthquake. It's, the big question is, did I do enough? Let's go look at some other properties, see if we can find, if we can learn more about retrofitting and getting ready for an earthquake. Let's go. Okay, we're in the center of Trona, uh, the little downtown section near the uh, plant. And uh, we came across this uh, commercial building. Before we get to the building, look at the floor. Look at that. Now, I don't wanna get too close to the building because the truth is that the roof is pushing this way. So that this building has been red tagged. And if we step back, you can see there's there's displacement in the roof itself so there's big big shifting happening in there that crack over there is a little bit over an inch i mean basically that stem wall snapped that's probably eight inches thick you know about that thick 
and it, it broke. It, it's broken all the way down. It's in two pieces. The concrete block wall cracked all the way to the top. So this is actually really unsafe to get too close to that. It's pretty devastating to see uh, what's happened here. This area is not anywhere near the density of population that we are uh, in LA or you know, kind of inland. Even Ridgecrest, there's way less housing here than Ridgecrest. For the magnitude that they suffered, you know, there aren't as many structures for, to fall down. We did see some tr tremendous amount of damage. This is new construction, okay? This is not built before the 70s. The randomness of the damage is really surprising. You can see one house completely devastated, red tagged, and then three houses on each side, yellow tagged, relatively minor damage. I think that we have to kind of better understand that. Is it the direction of the wave? Is it the way that one house was built versus another house was built? The materials that were used? We must focus all of our talent, all of our capabilities to prepare for this. I think the biggest mistake LA citywide has made, whether it's the software retrofitting or the bracing, is everybody wants to reduce the cost or focus on the cost. They're not focused on how do we use everything that we've learned for 15, 20, 30, 40 years of construction and engineering knowledge to be able to, to cope with this, not prevent it, to cope. That I think is the million dollar question. What do you think? I'd like to hear your opinion. Comment below. You know, it's really a surreal thing to see. You see the ground like that? I mean, they're like scars. It's a trip to see, you know, the edge of the ground so sharp, like, cause it, it just broke. And in here, there are these little tunnels, these little critter tunnels, right? That was completely covered. And now the, either this moved up or that moved down. Now, I don't know if you guys haven't spent a lot of time in the desert, but I, I haven't. The desert creates this crust. It's, it's kind of like a hard little shell on the top. See how hard that is? Then if I, if I push it, it'll, it'll crumble. So the, the bottom part is like a shale. You know, it's a soft dirt. And at the top, it gets crusty like that. You get a little bit of rain and it gets compacted, the first top little crust layer. It's an amazing force what an earthquake will do to our landscape. I don't want these videos to be misconstrued that I'm excited, you know, to have earthquakes and stuff because it's not that. My excitement really comes from the learning part, becoming better at your craft, having an opportunity to learn from, you know, the tragedies. When you look at a force like this, I mean, look at this, it, it like stepped down, it looks like in this section. The best use of these videos are to show you the property owner, you the building owner, that there's no such thing as over-engineering for an earthquake. If the earth can make this happen for hundreds of miles, your house, your buildings, it's, it's, it's not over-engineered. We're hoping that we did enough. That's, I think, the biggest takeaway from this trip is for me. If you've been thinking about getting your house bolted down or having your building software retrofitted, please give us a call. Please visit our website, softwareretrofitpros.com. You're going to learn everything that you need to know about house bolting and software retrofitting. My name is Alex with Software Retrofit Pro Planning. You, you don't need a contractor. For this kind of action, you need a team of pros.